Um, Bertrand, uh, we haven't met, well, we have now, <laughs> um, and all the way from Brisbane, um, a very versatile man by the looks of it, uh, with a bachelor's degree in physio, um, a certified Watson headache practitioner, certified Mulligan concepts practitioner, uh, a practitioner in acupuncture, and in clinical rehabilitation Pilates. Now, I assuming, I'm assuming, Bertrand, that towards the end, you'll give us a bit of a Pilates demo, will you? Are we looking forward to that? <laughs> I can do for the majority of ones. <laughs> um, Bertrand is the director and founder of the Australian Headache and Migraine Clinic in, in Queensland. There are three of those. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, um, um, a, a strong background in physiotherapy and a particular specialization in uh, headaches and migraines and tonight uh, you, you will be speaking about vestibular migraines um, there, there are many uh, vestibular conditions which cause dizziness and which cause um, other symptoms um, some of which are shared with many of sufferers and some of which are not um, but uh, it will be very interesting, Bertrand, to hear um, your um, thoughts about this, and then we encourage everyone to participate in the questions and answers at the end. Thank you, Bertrand, over to you. Thank you, Ollie. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you, uh, Anne, for organising and, and um, asking if I could present, and Regina as well for um, assisting uh, with the presentation tonight. So yes, as you all know today, tonight we'll be discussing about vestibular migraines. Now, I do understand that a lot of you who have joined tonight suffer from some form of vestibular symptoms. Um, now, it would be good to see, um, I don't know if you all know how you can, you can communicate through the chat box, but I'd love to see whether or not um, you are sufferers. Um, now, we do have, the topic is vestibular migraines, but there are so many similar conditions. And I'll just name a few on this slide through here. You may have heard of labyrinthitis, you may have heard of BPPV, otosclerosis, otitis, unsteadiness, nystagmus, acoustic neuroma. This is all just to name a few, but um, I'd love to see whether or not um, you do suffer from this. You can chat on the, if you know how to work the chat function, you can write a Y for yes or N for no. Um, but the more that I can understand from you all tonight, um, the more I can hopefully deliver um, a great um, presentation for you all. And I can see that, yes, you do vestibular migraine sufferers, Meniere's tinnitus as well. Um, the list goes on, Meniere's disease. So fantastic. So yeah, keep, keep um, writing through. But tonight, basically, we'll be discussing a lot about vestibular migraines, but a lot of the vestibular migraine symptoms are also similar and associated with all these other symptoms as well. So the context, the content, what are we discussing tonight? So we'll be discussing about what vestibular migraine is. A lot of people have heard about it. Some people may not have. Some people have been diagnosed with it. Some people may have been misdiagnosed with it. So hopefully after tonight, you'll have a clear understanding of what vestibular migraine is. You'll hopefully understand the signs and the symptoms, uh, the triggers. Hopefully you'll then understand how to diagnose or how we diagnose vestibular migraines and the cause of vestibular migraines. Hopefully we'll go over some effective treatment solutions on what hopefully you can do to minimize or reduce or manage vestibular migraines and we'll, then we'll go over a very short case study and then of course question and answers and um, my passion is in terms of headaches and migraines and vestibular symptoms so I love talking about headaches and migraines so uh, so I'm happy to for you all to ask as many questions as you'd love as you like. So about me, Ollie has done a fairly good introduction. So um, I am the director of the Australian Headache and Migraine Clinics. It's been established since 2014. We currently have three clinics in Queensland and we'll be expanding uh, in 2022. There will be um, one um, hopefully in New South Wales, closer to where you all are as well. My background, um, as Ollie has said, is a background in physiotherapy. 
I'm a certified Watson Headache practitioner, certified Mulligan concept practitioner, and the other things that Ollie has mentioned as well. Yes, yes, I can see a lot of people saying, yeah, that there will be a clinic in, in New South Wales. So yes, that will come shortly. Um, and we basically solely treat headaches, migraines, and vestibular conditions, which I know that a lot of the viewers here tonight do have uh, vestibular symptoms. So the focus of attention. Yes, there is a lot of similar conditions, um, including Meniere's disease, tinnitus, vertigo, but we will be discussing about vestibular migraine. Some of you may or may not um, suffer from this. So vestibular migraine, it's also known as vertigo, cervical headache. It's also known as vertigo migraine or migraine-related vestibulopathy. But it also has a lot of different names out there. But these are the probably the top three common names of vestibular migraines. Now, it's also known to be the second most common cause of vertigo. Now, vertigo, if you do suffer from vertigo, it's quite a debilitating condition to have. But it's interesting to know that vestibular migraine is the second most common cause of vertigo. It does affect women and female more so than men. So 1.5 to five times more often in women than men. So um, let's have a look. So what is vestibular migraine? Um, so vestibular migraine, basically it is a nervous system issue. So it's an issue due to the nervous system, whether it be the nerves, whether it be parts of the brain, um, that can cause repeated dizziness and or vertigo in people who have a history of migraine symptoms. Now, it's interesting that the, the name is the vestibular migraine because unlike traditional migraines, those with vestibular migraines may actually never in fact experience any headache pain or migraine pain as well. So you may be classified as having vestibular migraines, but yet your headache pain is actually absent. So that's where the confusion lies. A lot of people say, well, no, I don't have vestibular migraines because I don't have any pain in the head. Um, but you may still be classified as vestibular migraines because you have vestibular symptoms as well. Now, this is the actual diagnostic criteria, and it's in according to the the International Classification of Headache Disorder. It is somewhat a bit complicated to, to go through, um, but I'll break it down um, in the next further slides. But if you do have any questions about this, I can go over this um, in the quick questions and answers as well. So what are the signs and symptoms of vestibular migraines? Do you, the viewers listen here, do you actually suffer from vestibular, vestibular migraines or do you not? Hopefully after this, you'll have a clearer understanding. Now, we're going to break it down into two common um, symptoms. The first one is the vestibular symptoms. There's, there's three common vestibular symptoms with vestibular migraine. And the second one is there is five common headache or migraine symptoms associated with vestibular migraines. So we'll go into greater detail so you have a better understanding. So the first one is vestibular, uh, the vestibular symptoms. Now, I believe that a lot of you here do have some form of vestibular symptoms, whether it be BPPV, the vertigo, whether it be the tinnitus, whether it be um, um, the Meniere's disease. But what we classify with vestibular migraines, the three most common vestibular symptoms is vertigo, dizziness, and imbalance issues. Now, all three are very different. And we need to clearly identify whether you suffer from one of these three um, symptoms or all of these three symptoms. So let's go into vertigo first. <clears throat> so basically vertigo is more of an external um, sensation. So basically it's an issue with an involuntary um, muscle contraction in the eyes. Basically what will happen with the eyes is that it will beat from left to right continuously or it may go vertical up and down. Because of that, what sufferers will often um, experience and say is that the whole world is spinning right before my eyes. I'm sitting still, 
but the entire environment around myself is actually spinning constantly. And that's what vertigo is. It's an external um, sensation whereby visually you will see the entire room spinning around you. And this can be quite frightening. Now you might be shopping in Woolworths or Coles and all of a sudden you have a vertigo attack and it can be quite frightening and extremely debilitating to have as well. So this is what can happen in vestibular migraines. You will have, you may or may not have vertigo. Remember, it's an external sensation. The, the, whole, the whole world is spinning right before your eyes. The different thing with the dizziness is that it, dizziness is more of an internal sensation. Dizziness could be the woosiness, the heavy head, or the lightheadedness, um, and or a foggy head. A lot of people say, I've got a foggy head, I'm just dizzy, um, and, and so that's what dizziness is. It's more of an internal sensation. Remember, vertigo is more of an external sensation. Dizziness is, a, is an internal sensation. The third one now is imbalance, and this is more of a physical sensation. So imbalance is where you might be sitting or standing, you might be walking, and you'll be constantly veering off to the one side. You'll be imbalanced. Um, you might often see yourself. You'll, you'll be walking, all of a sudden you'll hit yourself in the door, or you'll walk into the wall without really knowing or realizing. You think you're walking straight, but then you'll have bruises on your arms, bruises on your legs. It's because you're, you're just veering off to the one side constantly. And that is imbalance. That is a physical um, sensation to have. So hopefully you guys will all understand now the three common vestibular symptoms of vestibular migraines. One is the vertigo, external sensation. The second one is the dizziness, internal sensation. And third one is imbalance, the physical sensation of what, what you will feel. Now, the next one is um, the five common headache symptoms for vestibular migraines. So what are the five common headache symptoms? So first one is that you may have headache pain or it may be completely absent. Headache pain may be all over, maybe unilateral on one side, maybe focus in the eye, maybe focus in the back of the head. It can be pain anywhere in the head. It can be sharp, can be stabbing pain can be focused on one very spot in the head. The second one is that you may have the nausea and vomiting with it as well. Um, you may also have constipation or diarrhea. It's actually very common to see that when I, when I treat patients that they suffer from nausea, they vomit a lot. When it gets really bad, they'll vomit and they'll have unfortunate constipation or actually I would say diarrhea with it as well. Third one is that you may have sensory deficits. So you might be sensitive to the light, sensitive to sound and sensitive to smell as well. So as you go through this attack, you may find that you just want to stay in a dark and quiet room. Um, you'll put the curtains down because the extra stimulus is just too much. They will aggravate your symptoms. You may have aura and you may or may not have heard of aura, but aura is basically where you will see visual symptoms um, squiggly lines, flashes, rainbow effects. That's a sensory deficit. Motor control deficits is that you may even have difficulty moving limbs um, to the point where you may have also something called hemiplegic migraine, whereby one half of your body shuts down temporarily, whereby you cannot physically move your hand or move one half of your, uh, the leg as well, which can be very scary. And those who have that for the first time may think that they're suffering from a stroke-like symptom. Um, whereas in fact, they have hemiplegic migraines associated with vestibular migraines as well. Motor control deficits, maybe you may have difficulty in speaking, um, articulating what you want to say, the word just doesn't come out. Swallowing as well. Cognitive deficits is the, is the fifth one. You might have poor memory, might be irritable, you might have poor concentration. Um, and yeah, you just can't think clearly as well. And when you suffer from this, yeah, you know, you, it's very hard to think clearly. You, your mathematical skills, if you're at work and you're doing algebra or focusing on work, how can you focus on work when you're suffering through this? It can be very debilitating. So let's talk about the possible triggers. What can trigger 
um, vestibular migraines. Now, if you don't suffer from vestibular migraines, you might still find that these may trigger some of your other symptoms. You may suffer from BPPV, and these are some of the similar sim uh, triggers as well. Head movements is quite a big thing. So sudden head movements, all of a sudden, if you quickly turn your head to the one side, that can trigger off a vestibular migraine attack. Um, or turning the head to a particular side. You may find that um, if you tie your shoelace, or I often find that with my patients, um, they say to me that whenever I tie my shoelace, but whenever I look down to my left side of my shoe and tie my shoelace, I get a full attack. Um, or maybe a specific head movement, tilting the head to the side, or sleeping position. They can never sleep on the left side or the right side. That may trigger their symptoms as well. Sometimes it may not be necessarily related to head movements, but it may be sustained head positions for a prolonged time. So you may be sitting, working, using the computer for a prolonged time. You may be in a bad posture, causing straining around the neck and all the nerves around through here, and that can also induce uh, a vestibular migraine attack. For some other people, it may be physical exertion. Um, they just cannot do any exercise because it will induce an attack. For some people, the external stimuli, for example, bright lights, strong smells, loud noises. Some people just can't go through uh, the shops like Myers Center where they've got the cosmetic and the, and the perfumes. People just will avoid that area because if they walk in there, they're bound to have an attack. Um, sudden changes in weather. You might experience this as well. If all of a sudden a sudden storm comes or if it's a very hot day, those can actually trigger these attacks as well. Visual spatial orientation is another interesting thing, such as walking down the aisle of a grocery store. That can set people off extremely as well. And it's usually because of the depth perception. They'll see something close up, then all of a sudden they have to look at something further in front of them. And that, that causes a lot of processing power into the brain. And because of that, um, that can actually trigger an attack as well because there's just too many things going on in, in the head. Neck discomfort can be another one. Sometimes they'll say, patients say, oh, I know that if my neck is feeling jammed up, this will actually, um, I'm bound to have an attack. An interesting thing is sometimes no triggers. And that is where it can be really frustrating for some of the sufferers because they say that if I know what my triggers are, I will avoid them but some have no triggers. And when they don't know what the triggers are, it will just come on at any time. And that's very hard for sufferers when they have no triggers at all. So how do we diagnose um, at our clinic? Now there's, there's different ways of diagnosing vestibular migraines. The way that I'll present tonight is how we diagnose at our clinic. Um, but keep in mind that you may see other health professionals that may have other assessments on how to diagnose. So the, the way that we assess and the way that we diagnose is that we assess something called the brain stem. Now, if you don't know what the brain stem is, it's basically a, an area of the brain or the lower portion of the brain, which connects the brain to the spinal cord. There's a little intermediate point which connects the brain to the spinal cord, and that's the brain stem. Now, what we do is that we have to assess this. And if we can identify that the brainstem is hypersensitive or sensitive and overactive, then we have a, a better indication that um, the brainstem is the cause of vestibular migraines. Um, now, if, however, we assess and we find out there's nothing related to the brainstem, it's not sensitized, then unfortunately it means that I and the clinicians here, we cannot help these patients because we can only treat the brainstem and we'll go over that in, in greater detail shortly. But the brainstem is the key. So what is the brainstem? Let's go into a bit of an anatomy for you all. It is responsible for many vital functions of life, such as breathing, consciousness, blood pressure, heart rate, sleep, and many other important uh, functions. The brainstem includes the pons, the medulla oblongata, the midbrain, and the midbrain. Can you see my cursor um, on there? If I move, yep, okay. Thank you, Anne, for letting me know. 
just gonna move things around. So this is where the brainstem is. The brainstem is this green section in here. We obviously know that this here, the big area here is the brain. The brainstem is this green section. It actually goes down a little bit lower than that. And then it connects to the, um, the spinal cord. So we have to investigate to see whether or not the brainstem is sensitized. If it is, then we know that we can help that individual person. So how do we diagnose? Um, that's a really important thing. How do we diagnose um, whether or not the brainstem is sensitized or not? How do we do this? So firstly, I want to show you in this diagram here, you've got the brain. Again, the brainstem is highlighted in pink and it does go as low as the first three bones in the neck. So this is bone number one, bone number two, bone number three. And all through here, you've got a lot of nerves which can all go innovate up into the head. You've got the 12 important cranial nerves as well. But let's have a look. Um, so who here, if you can put in your comments in here, who here thinks that their neck may be related to their symptoms? Either yes or no, Y for yes, N for no. Who here thinks that maybe the neck is causing a lot of their symptoms? Um, or who here doesn't think? I've got a few yeses, few yeses coming in. No question mark, yes. No, yes. Keep on going, guys, so I can see who I'm talking to. Some yeses, some no. Yes, possibly. No, yes. All right, maybe, yes. Okay, so it seems as if the majority are more inclined to say yes, and then maybe equal to no or question mark or possible. So I would show you this model on three. And the reason why I want to show you is because for those who have said no, or who, those who don't know, if you do suffer from vestibular migraines, and if you still don't know what the cause is, and if you're still suffering from it without knowing how to deal with it, and if you haven't had your neck or your brain stem thoroughly assessed, then I would strongly recommend that you do have your neck and your brain stem assessed to identify whether or not that is causing your symptoms, whether it be the vestibular migraines or the vertigo as well. So. Let's have a look at this. This is the neck, a model of the neck. We're looking at the back, the back of the neck. So something like this, the back of the neck, the bottom half of the neck. We're now then looking at bone number one, C1, bone number two, C2, and bone number three, C3. So this is how we're going to be assessing whether or not the brain stem is sensitive or not. And I'll go over that with you right now. So. What we normally find firstly, what we have to assess and how we assess is first we're gonna assess the C2, the second bone in the neck. Now those with vestibular migraines will, should often find that C2 looking from behind, C2 will often be diverted either to the one side, the left or to the right side. So from the side here, rotate either to the one side, okay? Now, if this is rotated side, it is because of a problem in between the second and the third bone. So if we open up this through here, there lies an important disc. You've got a disc in here in, in between every vertebrae of the, um, of, you've, got a, you've got a disc in between every vertebrae of the spine. Now, what's happening in here is that this disc in between bone number two and bone number three is pushing that patient out to the one side, whether it be the left side or the right side, just ever so slightly. Now, when this happens, when there's an off balance in that disc, that C2 will then deviate either to the left or to the right side. If that disc is pushing out to the left, it will push that C2 out to the side. It will actually cause a muscle in between C1 and C2 to spasm and tighten and contract. And that's what will then pull that C2 out to the side. That's why some people, those who have said yes in terms of the neck, you may often find that your neck just doesn't feel quite right. It might feel jammed up, it might feel tight, just might feel annoying. And, and because of that, that's the reason why it's because it is pulling out, it's contracting, it's spasming along through there. Now, the importance about this, the importance about the rotation, we talked about the brain stem. So firstly, you have the brain on top, right? You then have something called the brainstem, which we spoke about, and that goes through the upper three segments of the neck. Now, when there's a slight rotation 
in the neck because of that C2 rotation, it will cause unwanted pressure on that brainstem. It will cause all those nerves ending that disc, all those nerves to, to be sensitive because of that altered pressure in the rotation in there. Now, remember, the brainstem houses a lot of nerves in there. So it doesn't take much for it to become overactive only because of this slight rotation in here. So when this happens, it's no wonder why that brainstem now becomes hypersensitive and it can then trigger symptoms to travel up into the head, up into the ear, the vestibular symptoms, which can then cause vestibular attacks, the vertigo, the dizziness, the imbalance. It can cause pain in the head, the nausea or the vomiting as well. So that's one thing that we have to assess, whether or not it's deviated to the other one side. The other quite interesting thing is that we then assess the C1 and C2. And if we apply certain selective pressure on those areas, we should be able to <clears throat> induce or mimic symptoms of a vestibular migraine. So if we apply pressure in only temporary, and I saw your face, you're like, oh, that's quite scary. But it's only temporary. So if we were to apply pressure around that C1 or C2, we should be able to temporarily either reproduce a pressure in the head where they may get symptoms in the head, or we may be able to temporarily reproduce a bit of the dizziness or a vertigo-like symptom or an imbalance sensation as well. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't, but those that's how we, how we assess. Now, if that is all positive, then we know that the brainstem is sensitive. It's hypersensitive. And that is what is causing their symptoms up into the head. The interesting thing is sometimes these patients don't have any pain in the neck at all. They have no idea that the neck is causing their symptoms. But only once we assess it, then we can clearly identify that yes, yes or no, the brainstem is the cause. So hopefully this gives a bit of information in terms of how do we diagnose um, a sensitized brainstem and whether or not a sufferer is suffering from vestibular migraine. So let's have a look <clears throat> further. Now, a sensitized brainstem and the association with the vestibular migraines. Now, some of you may or may not have heard the 12 cranial nerves. They're very important nerves to um, basically help the body function. Now, all of these 12 cranial nerves emerge either directly from the brainstem or have close associations to the brainstem itself. Now, this slide, I will find it quite interesting for you all. Now, let's play, these are the 12 cranial nerves. Let's pay close attention to this one, number eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve. Now, this nerve innervates the vestibular symptom, which is in your ear the vestibular cochlear nerve. Now, when we know that a patient has a sensitized brainstem, which is in the neck, if that nerve in that vestibular cochlear nerve is also sensitized, it's gonna create a lot of sensitivity issues. It's gonna create a lot of haywire. It's gonna create a lot of mixed signals, which will go straight into the inner ear. Now we know the inner ear helps people with balance. If we don't have this inner ear, how are we going to balance? It's like uh, dogs and cats, their, their balance is with their whiskers. If you chop all their whiskers off, you know, that might be walking off, off balance. If we have an affected um, vestibular symptom, then we're going to have issues with our, with our uh, vestibular symptoms, vertigo, uh, dizziness, or imbalance. So it's quite important to know that um, the close association with this cranial nerve, number eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve. So in terms of treatment, so... If you are a vestibular migraine sufferer, and if we can determine and say that, yes, your brainstem is sensitive, then that is actually good news for us and you, because it means there is a treatment option available. But if you are assessed and we can find that this, the brainstem is not sensitized, there's nothing wrong with the neck, nothing wrong with the brainstem, then unfortunately it means that we can't help you. So it's pretty much almost black and white. It's like a, either yes, we can help you or no, we can't help you. If we can't help you, then we'll refer you on to other people that can hopefully try and diagnose and find the cause. But on our end, if we know that it is a brain stimulated issue, then that is the cause. And that means we can treat the cause. The most important thing that I find is that we have to find the cause. If we don't know what the cause is, 
then we can pump you with so much medications. Guess what it is? Um, and it's just, you're just gonna be a sufferer for a very, very long time. So what does the treatment consist? How do we at our clinic treat those with vestibular migraines? So the treatment consists of basically gentle manual therapy with sustained glides to specific vertebrae of the neck to desensitize the brainstem. So let's have a look at this model through here. So once again, remember, we know that C2 may be slightly deviated to the one side, either the left or to the right side. So what we need to do is that we need to bring that C2 back into the middle. That's number one. There's two steps to the treatment. Number one, bring that C2 back into the middle. Now, um, it might look scary. We don't, it's not a matter of clicking or clunking the joints, not like a chiropractic treatment. There's none of that because it's too harsh and that can actually set patients off and create them to be even more symptomatic. So basically through here, bringing that back, it's basically gentle pressure on certain areas of the vertebrae to bring to, uh, to help with that disc and to bring that back into the middle. So I'll just talk briefly, I won't go into too much detail just to try and keep on time. So once that C2 is back into the middle, we'll then be focusing up higher around the C1 and the C2, the first and second vertebrae, we'll apply selective pressure on those spots. From here on, we should be able to hopefully reproduce symptoms into the patient's head, whether it be discomfort in the head, whether it be some type of dizziness or vestibular symptoms. We hold onto that vertebrae completely still until the symptoms that we've reproduced in the head goes away. We then repeat that multiple times, reproduce symptoms into the head, hold it until it goes away. We do that so many times for a period of sessions until we may find that we can no longer reproduce anything in the head anymore. If we can't reproduce anything in the head, any discomfort, or any vestibular symptoms, it means more, more likely that we have now desensitized the brainstem. That means the brainstem is now no longer sensitive. And that means um, there should hopefully be a significant reduction in vestibular symptoms. So number one, getting that disc back into the middle, which is the underlying cause. Number two, desensitize the brainstem. And, and this pressure, it's just gentle pressure in, in that specific vertebrae. There's, it's not clunking, it's nothing scary. It's just gentle pressure on that area. And it's quite amazing when, when, when we do this, patients are like, oh my goodness, that is my symptoms. You are reproducing the symptoms. Um, and the patients often sometimes can break down in tears because they're thinking, I think, I, I think we're on some, onto something. Finally, someone has found and understand what I'm going through. Um, and it can be quite a, a touching experience uh, uh, when that happens with, uh, with patients as well. Let's go over a case study. So this is the, the last thing, the case study before we go over um, the question and answers. Uh, so this is a case study on a 51 year old male. Interestingly, it's a male. We briefly said that it occurs more in females than males. Um, this gentleman had a two year history of vestibular uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, symptoms included tinnitus, so ringing in, in the ears, dizziness, vertigo, the full um, spinning, the unsteadiness, unbalance. Uh, this patient had aura, so visual disturbances, and had phonophobia, so uh, very sensitive to the sound. If there were loud noises, that could actually induce symptoms. Effects on this patient's life, high anxiety, high stress, high depression, and depression because he's had it for two years. Um, and later on, we'll go over, he's seen many people, um, but he had the inability to go shopping, to walk down the aisle because um, you walk down the aisle, that depth perception, the visual spatial awareness would set things off. He um, had he, his business, he had to fly um, quite a lot, uh, whether it be interstate or local to meet up with clients. And he was really unable to, to fly because uh, during takeoff and landing, that would just really set off his symptoms. Um, so his work was really restricted. His triggers, caffeine, interestingly, could trigger his symptoms flying and shopping, walking down the aisle. Previous treatment, so he's seen many people, many GPs. Um, he's seen vestibular physiotherapists. So there are physios out there who are 
causing vestibular symptoms, uh, vestibular, and they will treat um, that. He's seen uh, those physios, unfortunately, didn't help. He's seen multiple ENTs, the ear, nose, and throat specialists, neurologists, multiple neurologists, chiropractors, um, food elimination, diet, um, and a lot of Dr. Google as well, trying to Google, trying to do home remedies, doing the whole lot. So it was quite debilitating for his life. Diagnosis, when he came to see me, um, he clearly suffered from vestibular migraines with the symptoms that he experienced with and with the, um, the assessment that we did. And it, it was due to a sensitized brainstem. Um, his C2 was deviated to the left side and we could reproduce symptoms up into the head, his vestibular symptoms. Treatment was basically we wanted to desensitize the brainstem. So that was performed. Let's have a look at what the outcome was. So his outcome uh, were actually heightened. So his symptoms actually increased in the initial two weeks of treatment. And this is something that can often happen whereby we treat and symptoms can actually flare up momentarily for a short period of time. And it's actually a fairly good sign if we can actually, rip, or if we can actually increase the symptoms or decrease. So either it gets worse or it gets better it's actually a positive sign because it means that we know we're on the right track where we're starting to treat the cause. So after six sessions over three week period, he could fly without any attack. Um, so he could fly. And so his work was a lot better. He, um, he could see clients as well. So he really thanked me for that. Flying was no longer an issue. After seven weeks of treatment, he no longer suffered from vestibular symptoms or he had very minimal symptoms nothing to what like he had before. He could go walking down the aisle. He could do things in life that he couldn't do. He was severely restricted before, but now he can perform and, and um, his life seemed to be restored. He currently now has a review with me every three months. Um, he's doing really good, uh, but he just chooses, he wants to come to see me every three months. Um, and we ensure that we keep on top of things because at times, if we don't look after the brainstem, if we don't look after the neck, we can easily regress backwards. So yes, this treatment can help. It's not a foolproof treatment. People can actually regress backwards. It's just like having a surgery for your lower back. If you have surgery to pin a vertebrae, yes, it can help you. But if you don't look after your back, if you're not doing your exercises, if you're, if you're hunching, bending incorrectly, you can regress backwards severely as well. So the content that we covered, everyone, is hopefully you have a better understanding of what vestibular migraine is. You hopefully have a better idea of what the signs and the symptoms are, the triggers, how we diagnose and how we find the cause. Remember, it's uh, other um, professionals may have other ways of diagnosing. Um, you hopefully have found some possible treatment options for those who suffer from vestibular migraines. And we've also gone through a case study as well. So thank you all. Hopefully you found that uh, quite interesting and um, I'll be sticking around and, and happy to answer questions. Um, so I'll leave it to um, Anne, Ollie and Regina to, um, to coordinate this. Right, there we go. Um, thank you very much, Bertrand. Um, fascinating. Um, the, um, I think what, uh, in looking at some of the questions and comments, um, one of the sort of overarching themes here uh, uh, is that when people have symptoms of um, imbalance, whether it's vertigo attacks or whether it's dizziness or, or whatever, it's notoriously difficult to diagnose what condition you have. The, um, there's a large percentage of this group here who have many ears, which is um, specific in the sense that there's hearing loss attached to it. So that, that has a certain sort of other component to it. Um, given what I've just said, I'd like to come back to this concept of um, what vestibular really means. Um, and if you go back to that first slide where you see all the different conditions that cause dizziness um, symptoms, there's so many. 
Um, some of them are related to the inner ear, which is vestibular. Um, now, I, I wondered, Bertrand, whether there are conditions of vestibular migraine that are not related to the brain stem. Uh, your, your therapy is all about um, desensitizing the brain stem. Can you have vestibular migraine caused by other causes and therefore another therapy is required? Yes, good question. So I'll just try to summarize that question. So <clears throat> can you have these symptoms, these, these similar symptoms, or can you even suffer from vestibular migraines, but yet it's not attributed to the to what we do, like a sensitized brainstem? The answer to that is definitely yes. Um, we, 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 we do assess patients and we can sometimes find that people may suffer from all these conditions, these similar conditions, but yet we cannot find anything wrong with a brainstem. And if that is the case, then clearly we can't treat or help that, that patient and we need to refer that patient on to foremost find out what the cause is. And again, the cause is so important. If we can find the cause, we can find a treatment solution for it. Right, just one more question from me. Is, uh, is it possible to have vestibular migraine, whether it's brainstem related or not, and uh, another condition or conditions concurrently? Yes, so the interesting thing is um, I work close with an ENT, um, specialist as well so um, and also a vestibular a physiotherapist as well and we we all work quite close together um, because it's yeah sometimes it's a big question like it's not easy you know people who suffer from this it's not easy on their life but also for us health practitioners sometimes it's not easy to really know what they're suffering from but the interesting thing is that um, we often see patients with vestibular migraines with a lot of a lot of these conditions associated together as well. So vestibular migraines with the, with the tinnitus, um, vestibular migraine patients who had been diagnosed with Meniere's disease, hearing issues as well. The, the really interesting thing is that I often find it quite fascinating that when I treat vestibular migraine sufferers, that their tinnitus, they report to me, well, they no longer have tinnitus or their tinnitus has drastically reduced um, or the Meniere's disease symptoms have reduced as well. Contra contrary though, um, sometimes we'll treat those with vestibular migraines will help that component, but the tinnitus or the Meniere's disease or the other symptoms are exactly the same. So that means we've helped with vestibular migraines, but there's something else causing those, those symptoms as well. Um, so hopefully that answers your yep. question. Yep, thank you, Bertrand. Um, so Jenny asks, the question about the use of Valium. Uh, she's used Valium for vertigo attacks, presumably many as related, um, found them useful. Uh, I, I personally have as well. Is that um, useful for vestibular migraine? Um, yes, so is Valium useful for vestibular migraines? Good question. So. Uh, the, so Valium, so Valium, um, that medication, trying to calm the body down. So it can definitely assist with it as well. Um, I would say that it's more or less of a temporary um, relief, um, trying to calm the body down, trying to calm the nervous system down. Those with, for example, if it is a sensitized brainstem, everything's going haywire. So how can you help that person? Some people um, try to fall asleep. They want to fall asleep. Some people take a lot of medications to fall asleep as well. So Valium can help um, basically reduce the body, um, calm, calm the body down and calm the nervous system down as well. So Valium can help, um, but more or less temporarily as, a, as opposed to a permanent solution. Um, Aaron asks whether you whether an MRI is helpful in diagnosing uh, vestibular migraines? Good question. So MRI, um, so those with vestibular migraines, usually you'll see a lot of people. Um, uh, usually the neurologist or uh, the doctors may refer on to, to get an MRI. 
uh, more often than not, um, the MRIs won't clearly see this. It's very hard to diagnose someone having vestibular migraines with an MRI, just much like it's like very hard to diagnose with an MRI for, for example, like for Meniere's disease, that, that can sometimes be difficult to diagnose as well. Um, from my perspective, if you were to look at um, what would help me, what visual scans would help me, and as we talked about before, we assess the neck, um, an X-ray, a simple X-ray through the mouth um, is a good indication for us to know which side of that vertebrae is deviated to um, and can confirm our diagnosis as well. But uh, MRI for minis, uh, for vertebral migraine, sometimes can be hard. MRI is good to rule out anything sinister. And that's something that we haven't talked about. Um, at times it can, can be something very sinister. Red flags is what we call it. Could it be um, a tumor? You know, and this is something that uh, that can often be be causing symptoms as well. Now, for those, although because I said the word tumor and cancer, it can be quite scary, um, and I don't want to scare a lot of your viewers because um, otherwise, a lot of people will think, okay, I've got to get an MRI because of tumor. I'll let you know when it is important to get an MRI for those viewers who have these symptoms. So, I would routinely request for an MRI if a patient is suffering from symptoms. But all of a sudden, they've had severe symptoms that is different to what they're currently suffering from. So if you are suffering from these symptoms for many, many years, and all of a sudden, it's changed dramatically, and you're not used to it, if it's changed dramatically, then I would say it is important to get an MRI. On the other hand, if you have been suffering from these symptoms and you've had this ongoingly for a very long time, nothing's changed, it is quite constant, then I would say that it's not, re it's not necessary to get an MRI because there's would most, like, most likely see that there's nothing sinister. If something is sinister is happening, like a, a cancer or tumor, um, then things will change. Your symptoms will clearly change and you will know that it is a threat to your body. Thank you. Um, there were a couple of questions that came in before the, the um, meeting. Um, one of those is about allergies. Is there a connection between allergies? Uh, the question is allergy stroke sensitivities. I, I assume that may be food or whatever. Is there a connection between allergies and vestibular migraines? Good question. So is there a connection between allergies and vestibular migraines? I can potentially flip that question slightly around and say that people will have certain triggers, for example, to pollens or dust or triggers to certain foods that can induce their symptoms. Um, and that is what we call a trigger as opposed to a cause. So sometimes you may, in, in the certain season, you may have more allergies and that can set off, for example, sinus headache, or that can actually set off headaches or migraines or vestibular migraines. And it is more or less because of it is a trigger, but not the cause. Um, um, can you repeat that question? I don't know if I've answered that question. Yeah, no, no, I think you haven't. And in fact, uh, there was a similar question about sinus uh, conditions and, and, and the connection with migraines. So probably the same, the same response. Mm. It might be a trigger rather than a direct connection. Yes, that's right. So there, there is something called sinus headache as well, and people will have pain in the head, heavy head, um, nasal congestion or nasal watering. And um, if the cause is, again, related to the neck, then that's because the, the nerves are triggering um, a, a mixed signal into the sinus cavity causing all those symptoms to, to come on as well. Bertrand, there's a, quite a technical question from Kate. I have a clipal feel fusion at C2 and C3 that has led to a retroflexed odontoid. Can you still treat this? <laughs> Good question. Okay, so <laughs> from my understanding is that C2, C3 has been fused or had some type of surgery. Um, because of the odontoid, so there may have been some type of fracture in the dens or the, the, the odontoid process. Um, if 
if the neck is stable, if the donative process is stable, so for those of you who don't know, I'll just show you. In the neck, C2 has this very big bone protruding up, which stabilizes the neck. If you didn't have that, your neck would just you know, fall off front and backwards. Um, so it's very important to have that. Um, so if it is um, stable, um, then we may be able to help. The treatment may not be as effective as opposed to someone with no surgical intervention. Um, uh, but we have helped those who've had surgery to the C23 and have effused C23, and we've still been able to help them. Um, but the effects may not be, we may not be able to have like 100% um, reduction symptoms, but we may be able to have 20%, 30% or, or something like that. I've got a similar question again, quite a specific one um, from Lynn. Um, and she's had your treatment. My C2 has been rotated to the right even after 10 months of treatment at your clinic. Is the treatment meant to fix the rotation? Good question. So, um, so we've had a patient who's come in, and I'll rephrase, they have treatment for the past 10 months. Right. And the C2 is still deviated to the one side. So for those of you again, C2 is deviated to the one side. Yes, correct. Ideally, we want to right. have the C2 as close to the midline as possible. Now, the, the interesting thing, that case study that I showed you with that 51-year-old male who had vestibular migraines, I have, in fact, never fully corrected his C2. His C2 is still slightly to the left side. It's not 100% in the middle, yet his symptoms have dramatically, drastically reduced. Ideally, we'd like it to be perfect in the midline, but for some people, um, just a slight change is potentially enough to bring their, their symptoms down that threshold to have um, very minimal symptoms. Oh, thank you. Um, and I'm, I might just have two more and then uh, I think we're getting close to time. Okay. And apologies if I've left anyone out. Uh, there's been a couple of um, questions about this issue of hearing loss and its relationship with migraine. So I think it's a sort of point of clarification again that hearing loss is not associated with vestibular migraines. Is that, is that correct? Uh, good question. So hearing loss is, is a sensory deficit and you can have um, hearing issues. So uh, tinnitus um, is, a, is a symptom of vestibular migraine as well. So uh, in general, Hearing is definitely a symptom of vestibular migraine, whether it be tinnitus, whether it be they, they hear high pitched, um, or it can also be just a, a reduction in the hearing as well. So the, so the interesting thing is, as I mentioned before, um, we can help patients sometimes um, vestibular migraines plus all their hearing issues uh, reduce significantly. Sometimes the vestibular migraines are gone or eradicated but they still have tinnitus or they still have hearing issues. If right. that's the case, then something else is causing those, those symptoms. Right, so the hear, hearing loss shouldn't persist. If it's persisting, then, then it's something else. Correct. Okay. Um, the, the, last, the last thing is um, uh, the availability of your uh, therapies and the fact that they're concentrated in Queensland. Is there any possibility of these therapies being available in New South Wales and or in country areas? Yes. So yes, because I think a lot of your, your viewers are from New South Wales. Um, so currently, um, for those who, who have joined a bit later from the start, so we do have three clinics in Queensland. There will be one in New South Wales um, in 2022. Um, but there are some practitioners uh, throughout Australia and some throughout the world who do what we do as well. Um, and, and we can refer those people on. Um, uh, so I'm more than happy for them to, I think I've got my email here that you can pass on. And then we can try and find out where potentially the closest um, practitioner um, that can do what we do uh, is to their hopefully home address. Okay. Very helpful. Thank, thank you, Bertrand.
Uh, Anne, over to you. Okay, thanks, Oli. Thanks, Bertrand. Really, that was truly a wonderful uh, presentation, so informative, and I'm sure with all the questions, and we still got lots of people tuned in, so you kept them interested, that's for sure, really. It's, it's fantastic. Thank you very much. And Thank you all. Thank you for having me. And, um, and uh, if there's any other, um, I'm more than happy to host another presentation later on down the track. It could be on another, another topic. Um, or you may have your viewers ask a lot of questions on a particular topic. I'm more than happy to, um, to have another presentation. As you know, I love talking about headaches and migraines <laughs> and vestibular symptoms. It's my life. It's my passion. And it's okay. something that I, I love doing. So okay, thank you all great, for joining. Bertrand. We'll take you up on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.